Hello and welcome back to another episode of the Create the Ripple podcast. I'm your host, Candace Smiley. Here we trust the Ningle and we tell the truth. This is a podcast we are looking to have conversations that matter, conversations that take courage to engage in, where we cut through the noise, the noise that exists online to bring you incredible content, amazing speakers and stories to inspire you to live your best, listen to yourself and tell the truth of who you are and who you just might become. All right. Well, welcome back to another episode of the Create the Ripple podcast. My guest today, she's a really cool lady, guys. I was, you know, doing some checking out before I uh, turned on the video and she she joined me and she looks fabulous as we are connecting and we are showing up as our true and authentic selves today, which, you know, for my listeners, you know, that's part of my favorite conversations. Katie, it's actually been... Mm, it's been a hot minute since I've actually recorded a podcast. I whacked my head and gave myself a concussion about six, eight weeks ago. So you're my first podcast back. So I'm super excited to be chatting with someone like yourself who just, I feel like we're going to be having coffee as girlfriends. But before I get too far into any of that, let's let the guests know who you are, where you come from, all that kind of good stuff. Give them your bio and then we'll dive into some questions. Sure. Sounds great. Uh, first and foremost, Candice, thank you for having me on. Thank goodness on your recovery from, oh my gosh, like all that. I can't even imagine. Jeez. But being authentic, like you said, is like super key. It's something like I was, and then it's something I lost and I hid from. And then it was like finding the right voice to pay attention to know what authentic self was. And so I'm excited for this conversation in this journey so we can learn and grow together. Thank you so much for having me. You're so welcome. Okay. Now, now you've piqued my curiosity, had some authenticity, lost the authenticity, yeah. didn't know how to find it. I mean, I can feel you on that because I certainly have my own story like that. And I, it's taken me a really long time to come to a place where I feel like I'm showing up every single day as I am, but as a recovering people pleaser. Sometimes that same. <laughs> sometimes it feel that feels a lot easier than others. So let's hear your story on that. Yeah, I, I mean, authenticity I, lost it. Tell me more about that. Yeah, where I jumped to is just like you know, my mom says I came out kicking and screaming, and I haven't stopped since. So I've always marched <laughs> to the beat of my own drum. Everyone called me an old soul when I was a child, a Renaissance person. You know, just like really interested in a lot of things with curiosity. So I just had this like zest for life and this confidence and this divine knowing and being and just like living it and doing what I wanted, like no matter what anyone else said. And I did it in a very bold, big way, which was a lot for a lot of people. But when I got around people who were cultured and more international, I felt they only celebrated those things, you know, which was really awesome. And that's probably because of my heritage of being Greek Orthodox Christian that that implemented um, strums of my life and who I was. But then there became this opportunity when I was like an entrepreneur as a young child and looking into like, quote unquote, you know, it being a man's world or blah, 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 all that stuff. We've, you know, all have heard brushstrokes over. And so like, I was just like really serious in business and what do I have to do? And I would invest in myself in so many ways. I would be like, success, jump. How high? Multi-millionaires, multi-billionaires. Like, what do I have to do? Left, right, do this, do this. And I would go around the world and I would do like everything within my own ethics, morals, and boundaries of what my baseline was. And some of it was knowing and some of it was unhealthy and some of it was a discovery and some of it was exciting and some of it was scary. And I did all those risque things and this and that to a certain extent. And then with, you know, all that being said, I just like lost myself and I chose to lose myself. And that was a choice. There's a like famous quote, like lose yourself to know yourself. And like, I had a knowing of what I was doing. And then I was traveling the world asking everyone else, like I did what I wanted to do. Right. And then there was a shift when I became like, I don't know if it was like, not not 19. It was the transition of like, 2021, where I started, instead of listening to the core of everything within and knowing, I started asking everyone. So I went on like a world decade tour of people pleasing and doing what everyone, what everyone else wanted me to do. Then circling back around being like, wait a minute, like I'm having an identity crisis. I thought this was happening with menopause or later on in life or the stigmas of like, blah, blah, blah. Like after you have children or whatever, or whatever that's supposed to be, but I'm feeling that now. And I'm like, what is going on? In on 11 11, last 11 11, 
I released Dreamland 1111-1111 on all streaming platforms in Web 2 and Web 3 as NFTs on the blockchain, but it's an exploration of divine femininity. And I am to explore power, to claim or reclaim one's power. And so for me, as a vessel, as an educator, as a student of learning, and as a teacher, I know my knowing and that divine knowing, but I, uh, through my journey, I realized a lot of people, they're knowing they never knew or they don't remember knowing because their fires got out so earlier on being brainwashed and domesticated by generational trauma and circumstances in the workplace and their environment. So the album is an homage to claiming one's power and or reclaiming. So for me, so for someone listening, it could be claiming your power, not knowing it. And for me, it was reclaiming my power. So and it aligns with my popular podcast called She's All Over the Place, season four that we're in right now. So in season three, I'm like, hmm, there's always a theme. I'm like, so last year, August, I was like, oh, season four is going to be about women empowerment and exploring divine femininity in all genders. So I went on this journey last October when it was manifesting, bubbling up in August, 2021. I decided I'm going to take my quote unquote weakest link my weakest link. I'm going to take this thing that's not consistently stable, where I'm consistently confident and empowered, where I have this flux of up and down of insecurity of speaking to divine feminine energy. And if I don't know, they're me messing with me or making fun of me, or I'm insecure and I'm messing with my own head. So I'm like, I'm going to focus on this. I'm going to call it out and I'm going to put it through my art. I'm going to put it through my popular podcast. She's all over the place women empowerment, not only through myself, but by having you on, having people on to hold hands so I can hold space to ask questions, to learn and grow together. I just got chill so we can learn and grow together. So, and then that was August and then November was the album. So then everything's aligned with my whole authentic self of my spirit, my being, of my internal core of who I am and what I want, how I want to serve and how I want to create space to empower others because I wish I had that when I was a little child. I love that you brought that up because I think the last, since 2020, I had a really big breakup in 2020 and that got me finally attached to my feminine side because mm. like you, I had entrepreneurial roots and I had spent so much of my early entrepreneurial days trying to be somebody trying to do all the things that I was told I needed to do. I met some really amazing people on the way. But as I look back now, I am struck by how many very masculine women I had run into, women who were very firmly rooted in their masculine energies, and just how that was really a divorce from, from myself. And coming now, like you say, to this place of authenticity, and I often talk about it as integrity, I tell people like one of the reasons I do the podcast is I want them to live in integrity with themselves first and foremost, because life takes on a real magical quality when you're doing it and you're not actually listening for anybody else's opinion. And that's new, certainly for me coming from this mm -hmm. place. I'm making decisions now. I'm like, oh, I didn't actually ask for your opinion, not because I wouldn't appreciate it or respect it, but I don't actually need your approval this time. <laughs> so I'm making a decision and I made some notes while you were talking about words like discernment. And I feel like, you know, the gift of discernment is really definitely strong with you. You just know yourself and know your own heart and know your own mind. And then you can begin to make a move in those decisions. So how are you finding that now talking all about this, not just women empowerment, but being in touch with your feminine side, right? Embracing that feminine energy. How's that showing up for you? Because I'm, I love those stories. Yeah, I'm loving it. I'm really loving it. I'm embracing it. And it's just becoming, I feel the internal strength and it's Gentile. You know, it's not a strength like a brick, but it's as if it is a brick, but with flowers and colors and grace and harmony and pearls and <laughs> yes. laughter. And But there's strength in that vulnerability. And that's been an exploration of what some things that I, I wasn't taught and some things like I struggle to show and be and show up for. So it's been a beautiful journey. And a quick example could be like last week I was in New York and I went to the Boss Yet King Pleasure exhibit. And I was, um, you know, I told a friend of mine about it because we were having a, a conversation about Boss Yet just a few days prior in San Diego when we were both speakers for this NFT conference. And um, I talked about mental health and the psychology of NFTs and 
she was on a women empowerment panel. There's NFT panels, non-fungible token panels. We were talking about how like she works, she's a creative director for Vayner NFT and they did the coach drop. And then we were talking about that the coach NFT drop, they did like 80 or something, I think she said. But then, you know, Basquiat, they did this collaboration with Basquiat. And so like a couple of days later, I know she was going to be in New York and I was going to be there. And this uh, Basquiat exhibition came up. So then she's like, oh, I'm going to invite some people from Vayner. And then she invited some like other people. So I met this woman, Nico, who's totally into fashion. I met these two Greek people who are, I'm um, Greek and they're Greek and they're cultured and they're big and they're loud and they have this personality like I do. And they loved me and I was loving them. And like, it was just like super cool. And it was like curated and it was just all manifested and all happened. And we were sharing stories and enjoying art and just the knickknacks that we had back and forth. And, you know, the backgrounds, how it all on a manifestation level, how it always, how it all curated and came about was just so organic and natural. But that's because I've been doing the work to show up in a way to sift out that stuff. So when an opportunity like this came about, then they were like, oh, how about, you know, the fun thing where people say, oh, let's go have a drink after or let's grab some food or something. And I feel a lot of times people split off or I don't have those opportunities where I'm invited to the next thing. This is just like one example of a brushstroke, not all the time, but it was a natural thing of like, oh, hey, let's like go to this place. And then this other, we're like, everyone's like, yeah. And then this one person like had this place in mind and she, we followed her there. And then we were just table talking for a couple hours and then I had to leave to get to the airport. But it was just, just reflecting on it was like, I was so embraced by the divine feminine energy. I was so embraced and like the reflection was all like fulfillment and positive and beautiful of the, what I gifted them, the energy and what they gave me. And it wasn't like in my head about it. Like, did I say too much or am I being analytical about what I said or how I said it or what I was wearing or judging other people or uh, like none of that stuff came out. It's like all that nonsense, all the toxicity and all the insecurity and all that stuff was just, it wasn't there. And I think by going on this exploration and empowering oneself in that way, it minimizes that stuff that takes our attention that doesn't matter that small one, 2% and giving it so much attention to really focusing on the divine essence of the universe of what is gifted in front of us because all that other stuff can come up. But if we have the power of the attention and we shape shift and we focus on the things that I was intently focused on because I was feeling fulfilled as a human being. It goes back to that whole idea, right? That we give not from, you know, within, but we give from the overflow, which only happens when you are really doing those things that are lighting you up, when you're living and breathing from that place of authenticity or integrity, which is a magical place to be, because then you're right. It's like you turn around, and you're like, oh my gosh, I felt in that moment. And I, I can relate to that. A couple of weeks ago, I met up with a friend of mine and I'm often worried about what I'm saying or what I'm doing. And I've been lately really like leaning into the moment, like really settling in and being present. So I think it's a very powerful quality that I've been playing with, right? Isn't it fun when we can get to that point in life where we're playing with it? So I was playing with curiosity. this concept of being, right? Yeah. Curiosity. Curiosity, I mean, the number one emotion, play. Uh, play, right? It's just messy. energies. I love it. Yes. So I was holding the space and I remember thinking, wow, I feel it felt like it changed the quality of the conversation that we were having. And I was reminded that we so often think change is so far out there, right? That we have to be doing something. And it was actually in the being that the real reward was coming out and, and coming through. And it was a powerful conversation for, for the two of us to, to mm. sit there and, and hold that space. I have a thought on that. That's okay. Go, Go for it. Yeah, uh, I definitely have a thought on that. So real quick, I did Vipassana. It's a 10-day silent meditation. I did Vipassana. And after the 10th day was on my mom's birthday, June 2nd, which was just like a, a full cleansing of psychological, physical being and everything. And I realized I was reflecting in that moment that prior, I would always be inflicting this irritation and this projection of being irritated with my mother, the mother wound, my own mother, and this thing coming up. And when I was done, because there was no electronics, no speaking, it was silent. When she picked me up, I wasn't on my social media. I wasn't on my phone. I was present. And I noticed because I was fully present, like you were just mentioning, which is why I'm sharing this story. I mentioned that when I was actually just really, really present, that irritation wasn't there. My mom was always being the way she was. It was me half splitting my attention to being on my social media and then just being annoyed with like my own thoughts of the projection of what I thought of her. But actually when I was in the moment, I was like, 
this is who she is. And I was just honoring and embracing her subtlety, her Gentileness, her voice, you know, her softness and how sweet she is. And I was able to really embrace it and be in the moment with that and, and know that I was blaming and shaming and projecting outside, but actually it was stuff that was happening inside that was going on. And it's not fair for me or my relationship with my mother. And it wasn't fair to her and she doesn't know it. And we don't, we don't know that we're doing it until we know we're not conscious that we're doing something until we're conscious of it. Right. It's like, Mm -hmm. it's a reciprocal pattern or it's it's a pattern that keeps going over and over. So it's the power of stopping and being instead of doing We're human beings, not human doers, human beings, like analyzing our patterns and our routines, because it seems like the back of our hand. So we're so ingrained with it that how can we on a psychological level detach from the energetic pattern when we think like, oh, I'm wearing glasses, like I need to wear glasses. So you feel like you need to do this or you need to do that as a part of your human being and your spirit because we're so attached to it. So deep non-attachment. Yeah. I'm curious about the woman empowerment, mm. right? Because you're very much about that. And I can see that not only do you, you know, live out loud so that other women can see it and know it and, you know, seeing your example, maybe potentially find it within themselves to do or be or say that thing that they want to do. But was there a moment for you when you realized you wanted to be that person or Mm. have you always been that person? Or sometimes there's a circumstance where you're like, I will be different from now on. And then you realize that your life has become someone else's roadmap, (laughs) right? From where they are to where they'd like to be. Yeah. I have three pivotal points that come up. Uh, I'll start with being 12. I wrote my first piece called The Oddball. I knew I was different. It was called, my first poetry piece is called The Oddball. And I knew I had this flame and I felt like we all had like this, this bonfire flame. And I saw a lot of people, their flames went out based on their communication and their tone and their bitterness and how they were and what was on the news and things of that nature. Very sensorially, just observing. I knew I had to protect this bonfire flame of mine. That was my fire and my passion for life. So I've always been very sacred and holding on to that. For dear life, even when you travel in the yes. world, like people wanting to smash that out every which way and me submitting to it after being so vigorous of not submitting and saying, if you want to go ahead. And I allowed it. And that was the exploration of losing myself to find myself again, to find that new fire, that light within. So that's a whole journey. Another time was when I was 14. I wanted to be a motivational speaker. I had it all planned out. I wanted to um, put an ad in the papers, uh, have a a two-day conference. And I wanted to speak with the microphone and tell people, charge them $250 a day in 2014, charge them $250 a day. I had the numbers, everything planned out. And I wanted to speak about how great life was and how to inspire and motivate them. And the only one that stopped me from doing that was me, the imposter syndrome. I thought, well, how are people going to listen to a 14 young, young little girl who hasn't traveled and been over the world? So I said, so then I gave myself a runaround. I said, let me travel the world. Let me go out there and accomplish things. And then I will do it. So I went and did all those things. And I'm, and that's what I'm doing now. So it's like, I always knew I wanted to do it. I just wonder if I would have done it. The imposter syndrome. I always wonder like, what if I would have done it? What if I would have been that prodigy? What if I would have been doing Ted talk for kids who even knew if they had Ted talks then right for kids. But yeah. what if, they didn't have YouTube, they didn't have Google then. But what if I would have been that person doing that thing? What if? But we can't live in the sports world. My, my coaches say, woulda, coulda, shoulda doesn't happen in the sports world. It doesn't happen in the real world either. So I'm doing it now. So it was meant to be. I'm going to pay it forward. I'm going to make an impact. And I'm in action doing that. I'm being that. I'm living it. And yes, I do have boatloads of experiences now of traveling the world and getting involved in different areas of life with with people and in the workplace. So um, I'm grateful that I have that. I'm grateful I I had that intuitive hit. I know what regret is. I'm not going to beat myself down for it. I'm not going to sit there and sulk in it for too long. But there's some healthy boundaries of communication of, you know, that. But that's a whole different life. That's a whole different life of what if would I be on this journey right now? Or would I have been on a different journey. Who knows? That's the beauty about life, the unknown and the known and what we can create. I love that. The unknown and the known and what we can create. And I I love what you were saying there because I can remember being about 12 or 14 and knowing what I wanted to do. And I knew I wanted to speak on stages and I've had this dress, which I found by the way, 
in my head, the shoes, you name it, I've seen it. And I had the same you know, effect that I had to go out and learn some things and, you know, get my teeth kicked in. Right. <laughs> Oof, <laughs> have some... have a, you have a nice grill. So I don't know. <laughs> I mean, your grill looks good. So yeah, exactly. Right. No, it's just filters, hon. It's just filters, filters to the zoom. <laughs> anyway, you know, it's one of those things that I think about and have recently, and I, I know a lot of my listeners are going to be the same way, we end up coming full circle. That person we really wanted to be before the world told us who we should be, we end up coming back there. And I think most of us have this story of like, you know, 10 years or 12 years or, or more of literally fighting to get back to this place. You're like, ah, here I am, <laughs> right? So how much, how powerful that is. And it's those stories that we come together and talk about. So I don't want to keep you for too, too long. I want people to go in and find your podcast and have a good listen. I want people to be connected to what you're doing. But as we begin to wrap up, is there something you'd love to leave the listeners with? I'd love to know what that is. Yeah, I loved everything you were saying. And I think we're aligned in a lot of ways. The only key word thing, and because words are energy and power and vibration, they so shift, right? So I feel like a lot of people will say like, I'm giving back, which is like, I know it's a term, but I think it's like we're paying it forward. And so mm. in regards to not auto-correcting you, but just like in the regards of like, fine, and I did it to myself, like, I want to go back to that feeling of how I was feeling. But then I realized there's no going back, but I want to be connected full circle with that source, but how I am now. Because so many women, if I say like with, with weight, because it's a big thing in body image, right? Is like how my body was, isn't going to be how I was a senior in high school or when I was in like running cross country or I was running 50 miles a week. However, I can get to a baseline of my core to feel good, to empower myself, but to shape shift my body in the way that I want it for now to propel forward. So there's no going back and, you know, mm -hmm. sulking in the getting that thing because it doesn't exist. It was a baseline of how we were, but we're evolving as humans. So I think that's really empowering. Caroline Mice comes up, MYSS. She's a mystic intuitive. Love her. Um, yeah, Overdrive. You can download it for free. Listen to up to 30 mm -hmm. audiobooks per month. She reads all of her audiobooks. But since we're specifically talking about like divine femininity and kind of like the, I brought up the mother womb is like mm -hmm. uh, Bethany Webster has an amazing book and you can listen to it on our uh, Overdrive. Bethany Webster, Discovering the Inner Mother is uh, I think that is the name of the book, but it's so great for divine femininity and understanding because so many people think something's wrong with them. A lot of people think with mental health and trauma and things like that, but actually it's the it's the mother womb. It's the connection with mother earth and the, the divine femininity that really underlies all the rooted issues that are happening in society and what's happening within ourselves that we can talk about now that's, you know, not on the forefront, but it's shifting to the forefront. So Bethany Webster gives an, like an amazing, uh, she'd be a great guest on your podcast. Thank you. I'd love to have her. <laughs> Cause yeah, just so I'm reaching good. out to her on my podcast too. Beautiful. Yeah. Thank you. I'd always been fascinated with the play between the two, like masculine and feminine energy. And that was mostly because I've always had this natural curiosity, not unlike yourself, just want to do things. And I loved when you were sharing in, in the beginning, it just struck me that I'm like, oh, good. I'm not the only one who's been basically doing things. And like, most people are like, you're doing what now? <laughs> and it's like, I always want to tell people, I'm like, I don't know. I have this extra energy. I wanted to do things and try things. And it's just, it's, it feels normal. As I started to learn about that, there are differences between the two sides and they have an impact. And I was like, well, how do I start to bring those two together, right? I want this wholeness. And that's been interesting now to trust this relatively overactive masculine side of myself, which was there to protect myself, right, from trauma. So became very much overactivated to now this beautiful, deep feminine, which holds space. And what that now means for the podcast, what that now means for those dreams I had, like you said, that full circle energy of, I'm glad I've got those few years to speak from but who knows what would have happened if I had just started speaking one, like you said, the intuitive hit hit, which is awesome. But anyway, thank you so much. I love that you brought up other people for us to read, to follow because connection, communication, it's just a huge part of who I am and what I do. Favorite book before I let you go. What's your favorite book? Well, I love the Bethany Webster book I just mentioned. Mm -hmm. I really love uh, The Broken Wings by Khalil Gibran. It's mm. so 
beautiful. And if you're not like a visual person, it's so sensorial and it just, it's so visual too. Even if you're not like it, it enhanced, it's like seeing a Van Gogh painting. It was just, it made things so colorful, the, the language, the literature, the tone and the stories and the imagination. And it was just super freeing and, and Mastery of Love by Don Miguel Ruiz. Oh. Love him. I read his four agreements every year. Like it's just yeah. prerequisite. January rolls around. Read the book. Yeah. <laughs> yes, exactly. And tune into Mastery of Love. It's so mm -hmm. beautiful yeah. how we're all very primal beings and then we're domesticated by our circumstances and through generational stuff and how everything's a blank canvas and we're just stories within stories and to be able to shape shift and say, okay, let me take the bags of everything of how I'm supposed to be or what I was told I needed to be by society, by school, by my teachers, by my parents, by my grandparents, by my brothers, by my friends. And let me just create, a, let me have a new blank canvas and let me take what I want from that and put it on there. And whatever I don't, let's just leave it off. But let's create some new things of what I want first and foremost. Yeah. First and foremost, let me put what I want on this canvas and then look at the bag to put on or to leave off, right? Yeah. And it's had a huge impact because I've got a daughter and she says all the time, mommy, everybody's different. She's such a good reminder. She's an extrovert. I'm an introvert. So we tend to rub each other the wrong way most of the time, but I absolutely love that. <laughs> yes. She is the main reason I am driven into the present moment all the time. And she'll say that so much. I think about that domesticated chapter, right? This domestication. I'm like, I don't want to be part of your domestication. So continue to be wild. And can we talk about being appropriate in this moment? <laughs> can we talk about what's appropriate and what's not appropriate? Anyway, I digress. And, and I got chills, but also definitely a lover's fairy tale. My first poetry book, Ooh. read it together. It's for all ages. And specifically, I you know, it's for like the introvert who with literature, you can travel and see the world without going anywhere. And then for a child, for their childlike imagination, which was mine, mm -hmm. I was a vessel being able to travel and see the world through God's grace. And, you know, it encapsulates like a parent being able to read it to their child of like reading, you know, children's books growing up. Well, this mm -hmm. is a lover's fairy tale was made for a child to be able to use their own imagination with dolphins and elephants and doggies and animals and flowers and just traveling to be able to use their imagination as well in a very like innocent childlike way. Love it. Well, thank you so much, Katie. It's been an absolute yeah. pleasure to hold space with you today. Yeah. Thank you for being my uh, first episode back. It feels good to uh, shake off the cobwebs and share space with a fellow podcaster. So thank you. Yes. Congratulations. My pleasure. Yeah, definitely. Awesome. Yeah. And for the rest of you, my beautiful listeners, thank you so much for tuning in today. If you enjoyed what Katie and I were sharing about and want to hear know and more about her, all of course, all of her links will be down below in the show notes. So have a listen and look for all of that. And for the rest of you, thank you so much. And we will catch you on the flip side.